Good morning, everyone. It's uh, Friday, October the 30th, Halloween Eve. I'm in my black uh, Halloween costume, somebody. I probably look like Kim Possible if I had on my green pants, but anyway, we're going to uh, start our chapter on wood. So uh, remember, I did move the test uh, based on the class vote from Monday to Wednesday. So Tony, you and I can work out the details of that uh, on Monday. And that test will be on chapter three, asphalt, and chapter five, iron and steel. So uh, this is chapter six, and um, we're gonna jump right in there with some of that. Get back to the top here. All right, can y'all see that? Thumbs up, good, okay, good. All right, this is uh, wood, and uh, I like this chapter. It's, uh, I think most people can relate to it uh, a little easier maybe than, uh, you know, iron and steel and some other things because we've all been around it. We have it in our houses, and a lot of people like to go on hikes and things, and so we'll try to make those connections to some of the practical side of this. It is, um, I would almost say the most common construction material. We look at it worldwide. It has universal appeal because of its, uh, its beauty. And we'll talk about, uh, if we get time, maybe Monday, we'll look up um, some of the different types of wood and just so you can see the different grain structure. And it's just so variable. Um, unlike concrete and steel, which we generally have a pretty good handle on things like strength, you know, there's a few things we'll talk about besides the type or species of wood, but that has a lot of impact on strength. So it can be, you know, um, relatively within its the category itself, it could be relatively weak or it could be relatively strong. But we'll, we'll relate, like when we talk about, we've learned uh, about modulus elasticity, uh, especially when we start talking about iron and steel. And so we'll relate that back uh, to wood. And as a matter of fact, we will actually, during the lab on Monday, we'll go over uh, some of those uh, properties for wood and talk about the testing of wood. We won't actually do the test, but we'll talk about it. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's probably the most common construction material because it's universally available. So uh, different types of trees and um, species are all over the world. And, and that makes it also one of the oldest construction materials that we have. Hey, there's a picture of the woods. So we can see we'll talk about these different kind of trees. And those, that looks like a picture from around here. Uh, a lot of hardwoods, as we might call them. One of the uh, other reasons why it's such a neat construction material um, is that we can work with it. And this shows a picture of someone kind of being uh, crafting something there. But you know, when we, when we place concrete or, you know, when we order steel and, and it arrives, if we have to make alterations to it, you know, if we have to cut and drill holes and those kind of things, it's, it's difficult at best. But wood is, is relatively easy to work with. You know, we can just take some um, generally available tools and, and we can kind of shape it and, and alter it if we need to. So it's, it's really neat material. Here's a nice picture of, uh, I don't know if that's a house. Uh, if it is, it's a big one. Uh, it, it may be like a, a, a church or auditorium or something like that. But, you know, you can see in the background a, a conventional wood framing, uh, either two by fours or two by sixes with headers and, and you know, you got your studs back there. And then you can kind of see what's in the front here is more like a, a heavy timber type of framing. Uh, so you got a, a big strong ridge beam and rafter system through there and then uh, tongue and groove ceiling material. So, uh, you know, most people would generally agree that that's it's very attractive type of construction. It's, it's warm, it's inviting, uh, you know, it, the wood has a nice grain structure or what we call character. So uh, it, that's what the, uh, the general appeal is for wood. Whereas, you know, like steel is typically cold uh, to the touch, wood is typically warm. 
these are neat too. So structurally, you know, back in the uh, uh, 1800s, they actually made, you know, covered bridges. Uh, you don't see too many of them anymore. There's one on, uh, I'm not sure which way Tony travels to Bluefield, but if you travel 219, you'd see one between uh, Union and Peterstown on your right coming down. Uh, there's a covered bridge and there's, there's a, a few that are left. Uh, most of these are not used for travel anymore, but uh, it's pretty neat historically and structurally to uh, try to preserve these, these structures. Uh, so, you know, there's some of these that are actually quite long as far as the span goes. So it's pretty neat to think about uh, how they did that and, and they've lasted this long. This is a neat structure. And I just pulled this picture. I'm not sure where this is, but uh, it's a newer structure. But you can see here that, uh, you know, we don't have to go away from wood because that, actually one of the later things we'll talk about, or probably Monday, uh, is we'll talk about how they can actually uh, manufacture wood to be very uh, strong. And you can see here, this is like, uh, you know, an arch that uh, has some tie rods uh, that is holding up the deck. And so that's a, that's a pretty neat uh, looking structure as well. All right, let's go back to two types of trees. Well, that looks like it's set up like a test question. Um, you've probably heard the term hardwoods and softwoods, but uh, deciduous and carnivorous. So the carnivorous is easy because it's cone bearing. So they have needles and cones. Those are your evergreens, your pines. Uh, they don't shed leaves. Uh, the deciduous or hardwood trees have the leaves that are shed, you know, this time of year and then grow back in the spring. Now, I do want to say when you use the term hardwoods and softwoods, um, that can kind of be misleading because in the deciduous category, you have some, uh, some wood, some trees that are relatively soft, um, like a sycamore. Uh, or, you know, uh, some types of poplars and those kind of things. They're relatively soft compared to like an oak, but they fall into the hardwoods category uh, because, you know, they're not needle or cone bearing. So deciduous and carnivorous. Uh, there's a good tree. Uh, nice oak tree you can see that's grown out in a field and you can see the maturity of it. And that would obviously be uh, a deciduous type of tree. And then there's um, a coniferous, one of your pines, and there's different types around here for that. All right, so let's look, if we look at the cross section, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go forward and I'll come back. So if we look at the cross section here, you can see on this, um, we see several things. So if we start, and uh, what I'll probably ask you to do is, is list these in order from inside to outside or outside to inside. But obviously we, we start on the outside with the bark and that's the protective layer of the tree. So one of the uh, things about trees and, and you know important for our timber industry is that if you, uh, a tree grows from the outside. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but it doesn't grow from the inside. The inside's actually dead. The very center or the pith here that we can see is actually dead. But the, the growth uh, layer is right there in the cambium layer. So, you know, you obviously, you've seen this before, you can kill a tree just by uh, hacking in just past the bark. Or if you take the bark off the outside, of course, that's going to kill the tree. Um, sapwood is, is basically inside the cambium layer. It's active in the growth process, but it does not grow. So, you know, the, the tree keeps adding right underneath the bark in that cambium layer. And then heartwood, which uh, is, is closest to the center, now the very center there is called the pith, uh, no strength at all, but the heartwood is closest to the center of the tree and it's dead fibers. Now, it's harder as far as the uh, consistency as, as we look at the cross section of the tree, but there's no growth there. So the only growth is in the cambium layer. Sapwood is active in the growth process, but it doesn't grow either. And there's that picture again. And you can see not all, not all uh, cross sections of trees have this uh, color, and this is black and white, but you can see, but some of them do. Some of your oaks, you can see the really dark heartwood, and then the sapwood is, is lighter. And then I like this picture because it shows actually the rays 
uh, or, or these, you know, this pass for nutrients to get out to the, the actual growth layer. And we'll talk about, of course, I know you've probably heard, uh, you can get some growth, I mean, the age information and things like that. I think that's coming up in a little bit. So the fibers of um, a tree are typically 70% cellulose, so that's the structural material, and then 25% of it's glue. Um, and depending on the type of tree, you know, you got water in there as well. Um, fibers grow in the spring and early summer, and, and then, uh, you know, they're typically dormant in the fall and winter. Um, and that depends on where, obviously, that you're located. But um, summer and autumn growth is, in, there's a difference in the, the type of growth. Um, and then once again, here's what I alluded to earlier. So obviously the rings, you know, they can actually estimate, I'll say, I won't say exactly, but they can estimate the age, but other vague information. So they could actually look back into, so especially like out west where they have those, you know, hundreds of year old trees, uh, the sequoias and things. They can actually look back and they can tell a little bit about maybe the, how much precipitation and uh, I won't say the climate, but the weather, you know, kind of some of that information they can get out of looking at the cross section of, uh, of the tree and the differences in the size of the rings. One of the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that wood is, is warm is uh, one of the reasons because it has air. And so um, it, those hollow fibers make it an excellent insulator. So if you had, uh, you know, a, a piece of wood, like a log, like a log home or something, and it's four or six inches thick, and then you had a four or six inches thick layer of concrete or steel or something like that, there's a huge difference in the, uh, the insulating value between the two because of the air that's there. And that's also why wood will float. So, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about later, uh, like on Monday, but you know, if you just take a piece of wood and, and you cut it or chop it and you throw it into the water, it's gonna float because of the air. And over time, uh, all of those air voids will become saturated and, and that's when uh, it would sink. But uh, that's what makes it a great insulator. All right, this is probably structurally one of the most important uh, concepts that I want you to learn about wood is, and so underline this if, or, or write it in your notes, that wood is an anisotropic material. And we'll look at some figures of this. But what that means is that the, if we're talking about strength uh, mainly here, is that the strength depends upon the direction of loading, or we could say the orientation of uh, the material itself. So if we had a block of wood and uh, you know we're standing up like this. There's several different ways that we can load that. We can load it like a column, or we could load it from the side, or like a beam, or something like that. So depending on how we load it, the strength varies tremendously. Whereas if you had um, if you had a piece of steel, it wouldn't matter which way you loaded it. The strength basically would be consistent. So wood is an anisotropic material. Uh, we'll talk about moisture a little bit later, but uh, moisture is significant in wood and um, the control of moisture is important. And so that's why most of the time uh, wood is kiln dried and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some slides on that in just a little bit. Uh, we don't want it to be completely dry. Uh, and so we actually want it to kind of acclimate to the area where we're going to do the construction. Here's, uh, here's some of the different ways that uh, we'll talk about loading wood. So uh, you can see in the, in the left side, both of these are compression, but one is parallel to the grain and one is perpendicular to the grain. So because the tree grows uh, up, when we load parallel to the grain, wood is actually strong, uh, relatively strong. But when we, when we push it from the side, we're kind of like, if you think of these as being tubes, these fibrous tubes, we're just kind of crushing those. So it's, it's not nearly as strong com, uh, in compression perpendicular to the grain. The same thing can be said here about uh, the shear and bending stress. So shear we're actually separating. That's a weird type of loading, but it does happen sometimes. Uh, not as strong parallel to the grain when we talk about shear, it, you know, one, one fiber sliding along the other. 
But when we talk about this bending stress, that's a little different than compression stress. Notice it's kind of up on uh, some type of support. Then uh, wood can be relatively strong. And that's what we would have most of the time. The bottom two is what we're looking for. We use wood in uh, like posts or columns or in compression. And then we also, a lot of times, so this would be like a two before stud. And then on the right would be uh, your rafters, your floor joists, any beam type of loading would be represented by a bending stress parallel to the grain. So even though, um, and you know, I could, I don't know if I can draw on this. It, it goes back to this and you guys have seen that. So even though we're loading like this, it's putting the fiber stresses in compression and then in tension, like that. So that's why this one is different than compression perpendicular to the grain, because we don't have any, any supports underneath that. Is that, you got that, Kristen? See what I'm saying? Good. All right. All right, so uh, when we talk about the word grain, we're talking about, um, you know, kind of the structure of those, those fibers. Um, and as, as we look through the, the length of the tree and the slope of the grain is, is important for really for two reasons. Um, structurally, it has a lot to do with strength because what's going on there is whether we're putting it in uh, compression parallel to the grain or whether we're putting in that bending and the stress from the tension or compression is running with the grain. That's what we want. It's the strongest that way. Uh, the, the the grain is what's actually the transferring and have having continuity uh, along the piece of wood. So when there is a branch there or there was a branch there and we have a knot, we have a discontinuity of stress. And so uh, this this bottom note here is is important. So it doesn't matter if a knot is tight or if it is loose, it is a stress discontinuity and therefore it is a weakness. Now it's not always, uh, you know, a bad thing. And uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll talk about flooring later. I mean, a lot of times people like knots and flooring or if you have siding, cause just because they, they like the way they look, it's character. But when we talk about your heavy timbers, it can be a problem. Uh, and that's why we'll talk about like manufactured wood lady, later in the, uh, and what they do about that to separate those uh, discontinuity points. All right, so there, you know, there you can see. So if I'm stressed, uh, let's just say once again, the it's wanting to, oh, here we go. If I'm stressed and I'm wanting to travel right down through here through these fibers, notice what I got to do. I got to go around whoop, like that. Uh, okay, so any any stress is going to have to travel around. So this area, no strength at all, even though you can see that knot is relatively tight. And so, you know, this is actually a good piece of lumber, but you can see at least a few stress discontinuity points here. And then also remember this is, when we talk about, uh, this is a good picture to show you this, notice where in the log that this piece of lumber is being cut from. So almost all of your heavy timbers, I don't want to say all, but almost all of your heavy timbers, you will see at least a part of the very center of the tree. Now, part of that has to do with, it would, the tree would have to be huge in order to, uh, to get, a, let's say a six by six, say six inches by six inches. That's what that looks like. Maybe it's an eight by eight. But in order for you to get that out of a log and not get the center, it would have to be a big piece of wood. So those trees are far uh, less typical than, let's just say, uh, uh, the pines that we have that are about 12 inches. But in addition to that, we're going to see, depending on where this is cut from the tree and how it's dried, uh, it tends to warp or distort differently. So I'll show you that. Keep that in mind as we go forward. Anybody got any questions so far? Okay, very good. All right, so let's talk about uh, lumber production. So obviously, uh, typically chainsaws and they fall the logs, they cut the tops and the bottoms off of it. And then they have to get them um, somewhere to where they can, uh, 
load them up on trucks and haul them to the sawmill or a lot of times you'll see them, uh, especially in the old days, they used to transport a lot of logs by water. So, uh, and that's something cool I wanna show you maybe Monday, you guys remind me to, uh, to tell you this. But uh, there's a lot of old logs like in the Mississippi River that have, uh, like I said, they at one time they floated, but then they became saturated and they sank to the bottom and uh, people go and, and kind of recover those from the bottom and they get they get big money out of them for uh, art type of uh, you know work or furniture or something like that. But the great thing about transporting in water is that uh, they could prevent shrinkage cracks because they keep the logs moist. So uh, at the meal, of course, the bark has to come off. Uh, the bark is, you know, the insects and uh, moisture and things like that. And then, of course, it, they just won't, it just won't last. So it's got to come off for all of your uh, dimension lumber and all of your heavy timber as well. Um, depending on, there's, a, there's two or three. This is a good test question here. I might ask you uh, two methods of cutting logs, so slash cut and rift cut. I'll show you the picture. That's set up pretty good. But depending on what you want to do, in other words, your desired product might uh, lend to how exactly you're going to cut these up. Now, you know, most of the time, um, sawmills will just do some type of a uh, slash cut here. I think the only thing probably different is this assumes that the, uh, the bark is already off. Now, my brother has a, a small sawmill, and the only difference would be is he would cut uh, kind of a rectangle or square first, and then you can see these will look more like boards and they won't have this circular on the outside. So, so this is discarded all the way around. And it does leave a lot of waste, but uh, then, you, then you cut your boards to whatever thickness you want or whatever you know, width you can get. And if you want, smaller lumber, of course, like a two by four or something, then they could do that. Um, I've never seen this rift cut like this, but uh, I will tell you that uh, I've always wanted to tour the Georgia Pacific uh, plant there in Green Valley, but it's a, it's a, they've got a lot of technology there. So, you know, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me that they could just program into a computer and it would, it could do uh, either of these. So this is slash cut rift cut or you know a combination you can see you can get all kinds of different lumber types here out of these and i think these are just illustrations but it gives you an idea kind of how that goes all right if you've ever heard the term uh rough lumber um it really means that it hasn't been uh dressed or plain that's probably the main thing so if you don't if you don't know this, let me just say that if you go to uh, Lowe's or somewhere and you buy a two by four, that uh, those are just nominal dimensions, and a two by four is actually uh, one and a half inches by three and a half inches. Okay, so it started out as rough lumber that was two by four. And then once they uh, plane it and you know sand it down nice and smooth, you lose on a two by four, you lose a half inch in both directions. So you know rough lumber. A lot of a lot of your old uh, houses was they were constructed with rough lumber. Uh, sometimes it makes them harder to finish, but it's it's strong because you've actually just got a lot more material there. So uh, strong and cheap, but rough. Now, the way that most of the stuff that you buy uh, at Lowe's, and you don't see this very often, but it's S4S. Okay, and I don't have that here. But that means surface four sides. Okay, and, and I think they leave off the two ends, even though they're smooth. Uh, they just call it S4S. But that's what that means, surface four sides. So to get all the sides and any edges there. And then, so these are the these are different categories. So you got rough, and then you got your your dress lumber, and then work lumber means we basically change the cross section. So uh, that's where like your your crown molding comes in. So if we take a piece of wood and we change the cross section somehow, so you know uh, maybe crown molding, I don't know, like this, that would be work lumber. And another one is like your tongue and groove. Okay, so, you know, maybe on this side, we got the groove, and then on this side, we got the tongue. 
So th that's, that's called our work lumber. So it would be dressed first and then uh, somehow run through a piece of uh, equipment or machinery that changes the cross section. This is just a picture of rough lumber and you can see um, maybe some ends need to be caught up. You can see the roughness of it and that it need to be planed and surfaced. And here's some that's some boards that have actually already been smoothed and so you can see how the difference in those two. And these are typical cross sections of some work lumber. So I uh, didn't show you the molding, but you can see the different types of uh, tongue and groove here. And um, can't get to the other side of that one. So here's a groove and here's a tongue. Uh, these are, and this is basic, shiplap would be uh, mainly for siding. Your tongue and groove, this is actually like when we talked about, remember we talked about um, concrete road slabs, and I'll just kind of draw it like this. And you know, as the, as the cars come across, if we didn't put the dowels in here, what would happen? Well, this slab would go down and then this slab would not be affected at all. And we would have a pretty good bump right there. So this dowel that we put in, you know, makes them kind of act together. Well, that's what a tongue and groove does. A tongue and groove is, is it not only locks it in, but it's a, it's a low transfer device. So on your ceilings and on your floors, you know, the next piece just fits in right here and it's a low transfer device. So even if the load is right here, this one is also affected. And so it's gonna maintain this nice level across the top. That's that's the purpose of your tongue and groove. Now this one's interesting because this one actually has a V joint here. So as we put these two together, I, I can't see, uh, you guys are blocking over here, <laughs> this right side, but it's got, a, it should have a V on the right side as well. So it looks like this as we go. And so that creates just a different, a different look. Uh, this is probably not great for a floor because that's just gonna catch dirt but it would be nice to have for a ceiling or a wall type of material. And there's some of these that actually have a, what we call a double V. So uh, you would have this cut out of this piece here as well. And that looks kind of neat too. All right, uh, that's a good test question. I'm trying to mark it, but I can't seasoning. So it's the process of reducing the moisture content. So wood that grows live, uh, lumber that grows live, you know, it's, it's obviously got a lot of moisture in it. So what we need to do is get that down to, a, a, you might say a stable moisture content. And, you know, we basically, you wonder why like uh, different times of the year, why doors swell or windows even, if you have wooden windows. Uh, so why is your door tight sometimes of the year and sometimes it's not, well, it's all about the moisture content. So we have to reduce that to a level to where that is, you could say minimized. Uh, there's not a whole lot of fluctuation or variance in the moisture content because uh, we don't want the volume change to take place. It's gonna take place a little bit, but we can't leave a whole lot of moisture in the wood. Green uh, wood, if we try to build a chair or something out of it, and then it dries, it's going to warp and twist and, and the connections are going to come apart. So we want to dry that lumber, not completely, but dry it down to the, the right moisture content before we uh, construct something out of it. I thought I had a slide on that. We'll go back. We'll get there. All right. I've already mentioned this. So um, lumber is cut to nominal, nominal sizes. So a two before is one and a half by uh, three and a half, you know, uh, a two by eight is one and a half by, I believe, seven and a quarter, or two by 10 is one and a half by like nine and a quarter, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the width of the blade and the planing reduces the sizes. Now, there's something out there called uh, a board foot. You don't hear a whole lot uh, unless you're, you deal with lumber, but uh, a board foot is uh, one square foot of board that is one inch thick, okay? So let's see if I can write on here and I'll show you how, how you might calculate that up. So here's a couple of examples here. A 12 foot three inch length of uh, two by four. Now we do use nominal dimensions in this calculation. This will be one of the few calculations we'll do in this chapter. But so if we look at, ooh, that's a crooked board in it. 
So if we look at uh, 12 foot 3 inches. Now I'm going to go ahead and convert that and if you have questions on how to do that, but that would actually be 12.25 feet. So 3 inches is a quarter of a foot, right? And then uh, what I say, 12 foot 3 inches, so 2 by 4. Now again, we're using nominal dimensions here. So we'll go ahead and say this 4 inches is equal to what? A third of a foot. I'll just write it that way. And then the thickness of this thing is two inches nominally. So the way that I do this in my mind is I find the square footage of the board. So, you know, what is this area right here? So this area would be 12.25 times uh, a third if we do it in square foot. So what is a third of 12.25 and divide by three would be, yeah, 4.08, I'm having trouble writing that. 4.08, all right. And then it's one inch thick. So since we have a two by four, we would multiply that square footage by the thickness of two inches, and that would give us about eight, a little over eight, it's actually what, 8.16 board feet. That's how we do that. All right, what about the, what about the next one? Uh, eight foot, 10 inch length. I don't know if I can erase here, so I'll just do another one. Are you, can y'all see that, me writing on there? Good, all right, so let's do this one real quick. So at eight foot, 10 inch length, eight foot, 10, all right, well, that's a little bit problematic. I think 10 is 0.83, so you can check me on that, so, but, so that would be 8.83 feet. <laughs> Uh, of two by eight. So eight inches would be equal to what? Two thirds of a foot, so 0. 0.67. So the area would be equal to 8.83, and I am rounding here a little bit, uh, times 0. 0.67. All right, that's, that's about 5.9. And then we have what? Two inches thick, so we'd multiply by two. So I got 11 point, uh, well, something's not right there, is it? Let's do that again. I'm going to do it all with my calculator this time. So 10 inches divided by 12 gives me 0.83, and I add the 8 to it. So 8.83, that's the length. And then I'm going to multiply by 8 inches wide. So 8 divided by 12 is 0.67. Got that right. So 5.89. Maybe that's what I did wrong. I don't know. Maybe this thing's wrong. And this is two inches thick. Yeah, that's wrong. This should be 11 point, let's just say eight board foot. I'm sorry about that, I need to correct that. All right, anybody got any questions on how we do that? So we get the square footage of the board face and then multiply by the thickness in inches. Square footage needs to be in square feet and the thickness in inches. Uh, and that's because again, one board foot is one square foot times one inch is thick. All right, we good on that? Everybody understand how to calculate board feet? All right, and that's what it looks like. So that's one square foot. That actually looks like it's 12 by, you know, 12 by 12 by one inch thick. All right, uh, let's go just a couple more slides and then we'll quit for today. Seasoning again, and I remember what that is, that's reducing the moisture content down to the level that we really want it to be. Um, and I think this is where we have the picture of, uh, of the different distortions. So uh, moisture content is the weight of water over the weight of dry wood, okay? Most of the time uh, for, for lumber, dimension lumber, especially we use kiln drying, okay? And, uh, but there are other ways to do that. I know uh, in Princeton, there's, I think they're still uh, in business. There's Appalachian, I think it's Appalachian log down in Stumpy Bottom. Uh, and they don't kiln dry their lumber, uh, but they use, I think they use borate, like a borate pressure treatment. And that would be under the hygroscopic chemicals. Now I can tell you, uh, I've used both of those and I, ca I can't really tell any difference. So that, you know, that does work, whichever process. So it probably depends on what they're producing and uh, as to which one of those they'd use. But either kiln drying or some type of a, a 
hydrotropic chemical can be used. But one way or another, we have to reduce that moisture content. Now you can see here, this is a stack of, of uh, what we might call green lumber that's going into this, this kiln. Uh, down at Sunby Bottom, they ad, actually have, uh, they, they do something with railroad ties. I don't know what they produce exactly, but you can actually see this from the 460. They have uh, these, these kilns down there. So a pretty neat process there. Uh, and this was, this was a slide, there's a picture here, just right there we go. Uh, that just gives you an idea, uh, and you can see this is pretty general, but about 8% is the average moisture content that we want in most of the United States. It's just slightly higher down in the southeast, and then there's a section out you can see um, around, what is that, Nevada, New Mexico, part of California. That's a little bit less than that. But that's about what we're looking for to kind of, as a starting point, for lumber uh, so that we, we can resist the stresses by the volume change and the twisting and the warping. So uh, the strength of wood increases as the moisture content decreases. So if you find a piece of wood that is really dry, it's typically stronger, but the problem that we have is it's more brittle. So uh, it, it tends to want to crack uh, and break a lot easier than, and, and anybody knows that that's been out and picked up a piece of wood, a uh, stick in the woods, it's easier to break uh, a dry piece of wood than it is a green piece of wood. And even though it can be relatively strong, that can be a problem in construction. So once again, we want to get the piece of wood to a moisture content that is, uh, you know, is stable. Now, uh, this bottom, note here is kind of interesting too, and I've got a good slide for it. Shrinkage is greater as the circumference is greater and is greater along the annual growth range. So that's a that's an interesting uh, slide. I'm going to go ahead and go to it so that you can see kind of what that does to, to lumber and to boards. So here's another good reason why we put the pith uh, into our lumber, if at all possible because you can see as this, as this board has dried, uh, as the moisture change affects those annual growth rings, you can see it's real close to here to being the same, but you get more shrinkage on the outside, but typically that board hasn't distorted a whole lot. Now, you get a piece of lumber that's cut like the middle one here, and while it shrinks and changes in size, it's not distorted at all, but check this one out. You've probably seen this before. This is actually called cupping, um, very difficult to deal with that piece of wood, but the reason why it cups is because of the way that the rings are, the annual rings are through the cross section of the wood. And so there's been a, an uneven drying. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about that, but then uh, they've just illustrated it here. The same thing can be seen here. So this one, this one dries and changes in size totally different than this bottom one does. And we'll talk about these board distortions later uh, and you know, which are easier or harder to, uh, to deal with. But that's why we get twists and crooks and, and bows in, in lumber that we have to work out. So it just depends on what kind of you're looking for as the end result to what we need to do there. And a lot of times uh, lumber is cold which means it's rejected or put to the side. Maybe we can cut and use part of it or something like that. You know, up to here, this twisted board is good. All right, I think that's probably, let me go back two slides. Um, we talked about some of this. Green wood, when it's fastened prematurely, will twist and warp and pull apart. So that's not a good thing. Uh, longitudinal shrinkage, so in the other direction, it's not a problem. Uh, it's, it's with the, the cross section that we have the problem. Wood that, and here's the last note, wood that swells actually and takes on too much water can cause more damage than wood that strengths. And this is because of the volume change. All right, I think we'll stop there today and we'll talk, uh, we'll pick up right here on Monday and talking about these uh, different properties and that'll tie in good with our lab on Monday. You guys have any questions? Have a great weekend.